Um, so uh, our next presenter is Chris Fletcher. Chris is Associate Professor of Classics at Louisiana State University, and he is the co-editor of another of our contributors, uh, with another of our contributors of the book Classical Antiquity in Heavily Metal Music, uh, to which he contributed a chapter on Virgil's Aeneid uh, and nationalism in heavy metal. He's also published extensively on the Roman use of Greek mythology. And as he allowed me to choose which bits of his work was ha were highlighted, and I have the uh, comedic sense of a 12-year-old boy, I've chosen to tell you that his most recent work is called The Ass of the Gods. <laughs> so, Achilles' Golden Ass, The Onus Attributed Dilution, and Greco-Roman Metamorphosis in Literature. Chris tells me that there is nothing he really needs to content warn in this presentation, but he is going to mention new metal and limp biscuits, so people might want to just get ready for that. <laughs> Over to you, Chris. All right, thank you. Let me uh, see if I can uh, remember how to do Zoom after uh, all these years. Well, when you share screen, just if you're going to play music, remember to enable audio and optimize for video. It should give you those. Yeah, those... no, no video today uh, or audio so all right can everybody see my screen yet here or no not yet all right all there right we go. perfect yeah all right i wasn't sure Lovely. you were going to actually uh finish the whole title of the, the <laughs> ass of the gods. Uh, I well, was going to say. I considered is, just leaving it there. <laughs> there is a part after the uh, the colon there, as it were. Yeah. So, uh, um, all right. So I'm delighted to be speaking here today for many reasons, uh, not least of them being that it was almost exactly 10 years ago that Osman, Umarhan, and I co-chaired a panel called Heavy Metal Classics, the Enduring Reception of Greek and Roman Antiquity by Heavy Metal Bands at a meeting of one of the biggest professional organizations for classics in the United States. I think I can speak for Osman when I say that we were shocked, but delighted by the popularity of the panel. We were put in a surprisingly large room and it was still standing room only. The response to our panel convinced us that there was an audience for a book uh, on the reception of the ancient world in metal music, which we then started putting together. It's therefore exciting and gratifying 10 years later to be spoke, speaking on only one of many panels as part of an entire international conference devoted to an expanded concept of the, the subject. Because so much has changed in the past 10 years and so much work has been done on classics and metal and on metal in general in that time, it's no longer necessary to stand up to argue that the subject has merit and that there is ample material for study. In fact, I believe we're at a point where it's worthwhile to step back and think about the few places within metal that the Greco-Roman world doesn't appear, and that's my topic today. I've chosen to focus on two subgenres, hair metal and new metal, for two reasons. The first is personal. Hair metal was my gateway to heavy metal. If I hadn't gotten into Poison, Motley Crue, and Warrant, I may never have gotten into Iron Maiden, Megadeth, and Entombed. I don't have the same kind of history or emotional connection with new metal, but as I'll show, there are numerous reasons it's worth linking these two subgenres together. The second reason I've chosen these is that they are also linked by being excluded from the website metalarchives.com, better known as the Encyclopedia Metallum. Throughout my time writing about and studying metal within an academic context, I've been struck by the difficulties and limitations of working in a nascent field such as metal studies especially in comparison with classics in which we're using resources that have been created over, you know, a period of thousands of years. Uh, if you've read a decent amount of metal studies, you've no doubt seen numerous statements such as only 12 bands like this are listed on the Encyclopedia Metallum or the Encyclo Encyclopedia Metallum includes no songs with this name. Such statements treat the site as the ultimate arbiter of all things metal, but I want to focus on the limitations of the site namely its explicitly narrow definition of metal. Scholars should be aware of the human biases baked into their tools and should be careful in how they frame conclusions that draw on such tools. For the rest of my time today then, I wanna look at the uses of classical antiquity and some of the subgenres of metal that many scholars and fans of metal, including the Encyclopedia Metallum, disdain. 
uh, I don't know if he's still around. I saw Eric Smeliak this morning and Smeliak maybe, and he refers to these as abject uh, genres. Uh, I will argue that it is not a coincidence that the same genres that are excluded are the ones that have the least engagement with classical antiquity. This in turn suggests that at its core, metal is to some extent defined by the use of pre-modern history, myth, and literature. The use of such material is not a fluke or a fringe phenomenon, but rather central. And in case it's not clear at this point, I want to stress that the reference to core metal subgenres in my title refers to the types of metal that most fans would agree are metal, and not things like metalcore or grindcore or deathcore. Uh, I spent way too long thinking about the, the title and never was happy with it. Anyhow, rather I'm interested in how hair metal and new metal lyrics are part of a larger self-positioning on the periphery of metal. I do not, however, want to get into a detailed discussion of how to define genre, both because the topic's been done to death by metal scholars with no hard and fast conclusions, and because discussions of genre and subgenre in metal are inseparable from tiresome notions of gatekeeping. I begin with hair metal both because of my personal interest and because of its chronological priority. Like so many aspects of hair metal, even its name is contested. I've seen it called many things, including glam rock, sleaze rock, cock rock, pop metal, glam metal, and party rock. Although much of the research on genre and metal has focused on musicological aspects, almost all of these names identify the subgenre through non-musical signifiers. This is a clear sign of the need to focus on other aspects, not just the lyrics, but also album art, videos, outfits, etc. cetera. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that today, obviously, in, in other papers. Uh, it's difficult to prove a negative, so I wanna run through the main examples of ancient Greek and Roman elements that I've found in hair metal to show both how few in number and how superficial in nature they are. As a disclaimer, I want to stress that there's no way I found all of them, so I can't make any claim that this survey is complete, and hopefully some of you can point me to, to things I've missed. Um, but I can say that I'm pretty sure I've got most of them, and even if I've missed, say, five for every one uh, I have found, there still would be very few of them in comparison with the number in folk metal, death metal, black metal, power metal, et cetera. To cast the net as wide as possible to show some of the continuity at work, I'm even going to include some borderline bands that are occasionally lumped in with hair metal, in part because they went through hair metal phases in the 80s uh, and or early 90s, but fit more with the hard rock tradition from which core metal diverged. As I've written elsewhere, references to the ancient world already appeared in what we might consider proto-metal, bands that are not generally labeled metal, but clearly influenced metal, and at least early on were sometimes even considered metal in the music press and or by fans. Um, these early references do not generally show any sustained engagement with classical material. Rather, they use the kind of famous words and phrases that just about anyone would have known. For example, Aerosmith was a 70s rock band who had a career resurgence in the hair metal era. Uh, but in 74, they had a song called Pandora's Box, and anyone familiar with Steven Tyler's lyrical predilections can guess what this is about. One hint, it's not about easy it. Um, a similar thing happens with the Scorpions, another heavy metal band from the 70s that becomes a part of the hair metal scene in the 80s. On their 1977 album, Taken by Force, they include their now famous song, The Sales of Charon. Although this song is somewhat thematic uh, in terms of its uh, musical mode, there's nothing specifically Greek about its evocation of dark magic and the underworld. And in its opposition of dark and light, it's arguably more Christian than Greco-Roman. Uh, but I don't think it's a coincidence the Scorpions are one of the few bands that can be considered hair metal that are also included in the Encyclopedia Metallum, presumably, presumably on the basis of their heavier, more riff-driven 70s material. Another one of these 70s rock bands with an 80, 80s hair metal phase is Kiss, uh, who abandoned their trademark face paint and costumes before releasing 1983's Lick It Up. Uh, which fits squarely within the look and sound of hair metal. But before that, on 1976's Destroyer, they had a song called God of Thunder, in which the narrator addresses a daughter of Aphrodite and declares, I was born on Olympus. But there is no attempt to engage with Greek myth in any way, or really even any message other than the general 
I'm a rock star, you will have sex with me. Um, not that those aren't important messages for rock and roll, but uh, as a reading of myth, one dimension. Uh, their song, Odyssey on the Elder, released in 1981, is about a space voyage and is arguably more interesting as an instance of the larger reception of Homer's Odyssey. One of my favorite references to the ancient Greco-Roman world and hard rock comes in ACDC's Touch Too Much off of 1979's Highway to Hell. Um, there we go. Hold on. I should mention that we've been having crazy weather. So uh, if I lose power or something, you'll just have to pretend that the rest of the talk was even more brilliant than the first part already. And then you can start happy hour early. Um, anyhow, in that song, Bon Scott likens the woman he is singing about to the body of Venus with arms, a clear allusion to the armless statue uh, known as Venus de Milo because it was found on the Greek island of Milos. It's a throwaway line in a song that is, like many of Scott's lyrics, primarily about sex. And it is not unlike other lyrics from rock bands that have never been considered metal. For instance, on Bruce Springsteen's 1980 album, The River, the song Crush on You contains the line, she makes the Venus de Milo look like she's got no style. I always want to say style-o there to get the rhyme. But uh, Both are simply testaments to the familiarity with the statue and who it is supposed to represent. There is a similarly superficial instance on the same ACDC album in the second verse of uh, If You Want Blood, You've Got It, feeling like a Christian locked in a cage, thrown to the lions on the second page. But it was only in 1995 after they had switched singers and gone through what some consider uh, a sort of hair metal phase in the 80s that ACDC offered any kind of sustained instance of classical reception in Hail Caesar from 1995's Ball Breaker. Um, but rather than being any kind of retelling or discussion of Julius Caesar per se, this song is a meditation on the cult of personality and the power of charismatic rulers. And you can see that even in this little screen grab from the, the video here. The rest of the video is very silly with Angus being... Um, inserted in clips from Swords and Sandal movies and things like that. But then there's sort of the performance uh, shot. Um, this kind of cult of personality uh, is an important part of the reception of Caesar. And so in some ways, this is more perceptive than many instances of classical reception uh, in metal, but it's certainly not one that required any kind of research. Like the earlier songs, this one uh, appeals to the popular knowledge of classical antiquity, the kind of things that you could assume that the average person would know. Such references are a testament to the permeation of aspects of the pre-modern world, but show little beyond that. Uh, as an aside, I should note that in his autobiography, Brian Johnson says that he was working on a musical about Helen of Troy at one point, but it's never materialized and it and sounds like it never will. Unsurprisingly, one of the few references that we find in the songs of bands specifically from the 80s, the fewer people would argue against include, uh, against including under the heading of hair metal, uh, presents the same kind of view of Caesar. With, the, with its chorus of Hail Caesar, Lizzie Borden's Notorious is a forerunner to the ACDC song I mentioned. And like it is more of a general meditation on power rather than anything about Caesar per se. Uh, but Lizzie Borden, in fact, stands out among their 80s hair metal peel peers for drawing on history and literature on multiple occasions, albeit still never with any uh, great depth. It's perhaps not surprising, then, that like the Scorpions, they are also included in the Encyclopedia Metallum. But as with the ACDC songs, these are generally the kinds of things that are part of the background noise of Western culture. They do not reflect research or a desire to share with the audience some kind of historical lesson or gush about literature, uh, let alone make any kind of nationalistic uh, statement. And I think of something like Iron Maiden's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner as just nerdy geeking out, right? It's wanting to gush about literature for the sake of, of literature. Uh, and things like this Lizzie Borden and the ACDC certainly don't offer the same kind of sustained purposeful engagement with antiquity as say some of Elvati's uh, work. 
Before moving on, I should note that ancient Egypt also appears occasionally in hair metal and generally in as superficial a manner. Um, a song such as Blue Murder's Valley of the Kings is evocative as a meditation on death, immortality, and slavery, but wouldn't require more knowledge than you could get from uh, a now outdated five-minute documentary on the Valley of Kings. Uh, and the same could even be said of its video. It's a weird video because there's vignettes kind of of actors who are supposed to be ancient Egyptian, but it's so interwoven with the performance that it, it's hard to get a, uh, a good screenshot. So here you just see John uh, Sykes shredding. Um, so even if we include Egypt, hair metal shows little interest in the ancient Mediterranean world with the exception of the Bible, which is kind of its own thing in some ways. Uh, the references are to the most famous people, places, and images, and even when they are the focus of an entire song, there's little sustained engagement with the material. The same is true when we turn to new metal, and this is where I'm on less sure footing. Unlike hair metal, which I've been listening to for almost 40 years, I'm not as personally familiar with new metal. And I mention this not to burnish my own metal cred. Uh, one of the great things about middle age is the disappearance of the need for that kind of thing. Uh, but to return to my earlier point about the Encyclopedia Metallum. Because that site does not include new metal, it makes it even harder to do this kind of research. With hair metal, I have a lifetime's worth of listening and reading and arguing with friends that can provide the background and material for such a study, but I'm more reliant on others' tools for this part. Like hair metal, new metal is the term that many bands and fans of those bands disavow, so there's always some disagreement whether a band fits or not. Even casting a relatively wide net, though, I've been able to find very few new metal songs with any kind of classical element, far fewer even than the amount I was able to find in hair metal. Again, some of this is likely my own greater familiarity with that genre, and some of it may be the fact that hair metal predates new metal by a dozen years or so, depending on how you count. Uh, and that gap in time is a key way that the lack in new metal differs from the one in hair metal. By the time new metal came along, the ancient world was firmly entrenched in traditional metal. So these bands would have had models to follow and at least some fans prepared for such topics. Another difference is that the few references I have found come from after the heyday of new metal, suggesting that references to the ancient Greco-Roman Greco world aren't even remotely a defining feature of the subgenre. These references don't appear in the foundational best-known albums from the so-called Big Six, Corn, Limp Biscuit, Slipknot, Deftones, Linkin Park, and System of a Down. Uh, it's only in 2002, for instance, that Mudvayne has a song with a Latin title, Solo et Coagula, or Dissolve and Congeal, a phrase drawn from medieval alchemy. The song refers directly to alchemy, so the Latin is used knowingly and reflects at least some awareness of original context, but it's not an ancient context. Uh, one of the few bands with multiple references or allusions to classical antiquity seems to be Otep, the band started by Otep Shemaya, who's known for writing more politically oriented lyrics than most of her new metal peers. Two songs from 2009, again, note the, uh, the time frame, uh, from 2009, Smash the Control Machine, exemplify this tendency. First, Sweet Tooth contains the line, her fingers are Caesar, slowly conquering me, which seems to be an ironic inversion of Julius Caesar's Wainy Weedy Weeky, I came, I saw, I conquered, which he supposedly said in response to the ease and swiftness with which he defeated Pharnakis II at the Battle of Zila in 47 BCE. And I should point out, obviously, that today's the, the Ides of March. As everybody knows, this is, again, Caesar in the background uh, of culture. Uh, in which Shakespeare played a role. So there's another thing like Charlotte was talking about where we can see the steps along the way. Uh, Caesar reappear, reappears in the title track. They say the rent is due, Caesar's on to you, so you better remember your place. The song is an anti-capitalistic call to arms, which suggests that the rent is due connected with Caesar is perhaps an allusion to Jesus's command to Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, to quote the King James Version of Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. These two lines testify once again to the popularity of the figure of a Caesar, not Julius in this case, and reflect the importance of Christianity for the reception of ancient Rome. 
I want to stress one final time that I'm not claiming to have found every single reference or allusion to ancient Greece or Rome and hair metal and or new metal. And again, if you know ones that uh, you think I've missed, I would happily uh, listen to those. Um, but I think I've shown there are a few of them and that those that exist are generally not central to the song in the sense that the songs are not about these figures or events or texts. Moreover, they tend to involve the most popular figures, names, or images from antiquity. So what does this tell us about classics and what does it tell us about metal? This returns us to the issue of gatekeeping I mentioned above and to possible similarities between these two genres. Many critics of the two consider them more image-driven than traditional metal. Uh, Ian Christie, for instance, makes this link between the two and his influential sound of the beast. But to say that new metal bands were more image conscious than a lot of black metal bands or even early thrash bands such as Slayer is overly simplistic, if not outright wrong. So it's necessary to look elsewhere. For my purposes, I think there are three related phenomena that link the subgenres and, le and led to criticism, lyrics, song structure, and popularity. Neither subgenre refers to the ancient world much, let alone in detail because the songs are to generalize extremely broadly about sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the case of hair metal, and about sex, angst, and rage in the case of new metal. Obviously, this is painting with a very broad brush, but I don't think it's unfair to say that the lyrics of these subgenres primarily focus on day-to-day -day life. Although such lyrics, often dismissed as superficial, seem to be at least part of why these bands are considered unmetal, it is surely at least in part because of these lyrics that these genres are among the most popular in metal, especially when paired with an accessible verse-chorus-verse structure. Finally, because these are among the most commercially successful subgenres, bands in them are accused of selling out or of making pop music. So what does it say that the Encyclopedia Metallum does not include many of the best-selling bands in metal? Again, this is a reminder that we need to be careful when using any resource, and also that if metal studies is to grow as a discipline, there is still a lot of basic work that needs to be done. When I teach classical reception studies to my students, I tell them that when properly done, it should tell us something not just about classics, but also about some other area. From a classics perspective, the prevalence of a figure like Julius Caesar, and even in subgenres of metal that don't tend to talk about the ancient world, is a further testament to just how deeply ingrained some of these names still are. Caesar, Pandora's Bach, and Box, and the Venus de Milo are part of the background noise of modern culture. But I think this topic and the larger study of classical reception in metal music and about uh, global premodernity in metal music more broadly actually tells us more about metal than classics. It helps highlight the ways in which references to other worlds not just the pre-modern world, but also fantasy and sci-fi worlds are a core part of metal's identity, especially those genres that seem to have the most cachet with scholars and a certain type of fan. But now that we've reached a point at which metal scholars are aware of how widespread the pre-modern world is in metal, perhaps it's time also to think about where it doesn't appear and why. All right. Thank you.